everyone to part two of the future of internet freedom. Uh, today we're going to discuss policies and priorities for the new administration. Um, you can see on this particular page um, our generous uh, co-sponsors um, uh, from the American University, uh, the Internet Society, and the Voices of Internet Freedom Coalition. And we want to thank them um, uh, for their um, support and uh, dedication to, uh, to internet freedom. So let's go ahead and take that down. Thanks again, um, uh, everyone. Um, in December of last year, we held our first event. And at that time, we decided to look at the demand side of internet freedom. So we had represented the voices of activists, human rights workers, journalists, and others. And then um, on the technology side, uh, we looked at how many people in the world actually use uh, anti-censorship tools and what the um, uh, demand is. Well, that situation certainly hasn't changed. If we look um, just recently in the headlines about the um, military coup in Myanmar, uh, my friends in the anti-censorship communities tell me that uh, 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 internet usage, um, barring the two interruptions that we have, that, that the government um, uh, invoked, um, are at least two orders of magnitude greater than they were before. So there is no let up in demand. But what we're going to do today here is talk about uh, supply. And by supply, we mean where does the money come from to fund internet freedom? And um, who is doing it? And how are priorities set? And whether we, write, we have the right strategic focus um, uh, or not. So I'm going to um, just briefly discuss um, where the supply situation is, and then I will introduce our panelists and we'll go ahead and start the dialogue. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And the first thing I'd like to look at is the, um, at least from the United States standpoint, the background on, on internet freedom. Um, I count that there have been eight congressional resolutions beginning in 2009 that have indicated a strong bipartisan support for a free and open internet, uh, including this famous Senate resolution um, from the 111th Congress. These resolutions pass with no opposition virtually. And uh, the policy of supporting internet freedom around the world has also been uh, matched with uh, spending on internet freedom programs as well. Many of these resolutions were specific to certain countries. Others uh, were in support of global um, uh, internet freedom. So what we have in the US today is, um, at least up until now, a strong bipartisan support um, for uh, freedom on the net. If I now look at the numbers, um, I uh, went back to uh, the, the budget bills uh, from 2016 up through the latest budget bill, which was passed and signed by uh, the president, on, uh, former president, uh, on uh, December 27th. And using uh, 2016 as a base year, the overall top line funding in the federal budget for internet freedom programs has written uh, risen by um, uh, 22%. So that percent change indicates again that um, Congress has um, seen uh, the value of these programs and continues to uh, raise its levels of funding. So in 2021, we have the highest top line ever uh, at uh, $70 million. Now then if I look at where the uh, money actually goes, this is a rather intricate process and I'm not going to go into um, all of these uh, numbers. However, um, 
there are six major areas in which internet freedom programs um, uh, are, um, are operating in. Um, this does not include um, some technical projects in the National Science Foundation or DARPA. Uh, it doesn't include um, uh, USAID's um, uh, information and communications uh, technologies for development, you know, or for um, the Global Engagement Center and other agencies that deal with um, uh, uh, other forms of democracy promotion, rule of law, and countering disinformation. Nevertheless, these six areas include uh, priority regions. Um, in the 2021 budget, for example, um, there, there are specific uh, allocations for Eastern Europe and for Asia. Uh, there is support for um, uh, anti-censorship or circumvention tools and techniques um, both existing techniques um, and uh, new technologies. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more today about the digital security side of internet freedom, because in addition to uh, providing access, we also have to make um, uh, arrangements and develop tools and techniques to protect activists, journalists, and others um, who um, uh, are communicating um, in, uh, from repressive environments. We heard a lot about that last December. Uh, there is direct support for um, certain circumvention tools. This is particularly true with agencies like USAGM that support uh, their own um, uh, broadcasting and content creation uh, and need to support um, tools that will deliver that content um, across the world. Um, and then two other areas, policy and advocacy. Uh, certainly um, infrastructure, human infrastructure that builds um, support for civil society organizations in the area of internet governance. Uh, human rights um, and rule of law are very important. And then uh, a certain amount of applied research to uh, try and uh, catalog where things stand, um, what the state of internet freedom is in the world and the specific uh, laws and regulations that um, are um, uh, operating today. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. And if you would like to um, uh, just start your video and give us a wave, um, I'd like to begin by um, introducing um, the Dean of the uh, Engineering School at uh, Purdue University and um, our former Science and Technology Advisor for the U.S. Secretary of State, Dr. Meng Chang. Dr. Chang, it's really a pleasure to have you here today. I know that you are a champion of internet freedom, and to prove that, as a professor, I'm just going to give everyone in the room here a reading assignment. And I'd like them to read The Network Life and The Power of Networks, uh, which are two excellent books. They answer all kinds of questions uh, that we have um, and uh, uh, they're fun to read and very informative and very insightful. So uh, please do uh, look them up. Um, Second, I'd like to uh, introduce Clara Sal. Hello, Clara. Glad you could make it. You are uh, appearing from the West Coast, is that right? Okay, great. Clara is president of the board of the White House Presidential Innovation Fellows Foundation, and she is the former chief technology officer of the Department of Homeland Security. So I'm sure she's going to have a lot to say. Um, about the issues in front of us today. Next, we have uh, my longstanding friend and colleague, Maziar Bahari, who is uh, coming to us from London. Uh, Maziar is an award-winning film producer and president of Journalism for Change. If you have ever seen the film about uh, Iran called Rosewater, uh, Maziar is the um, producer and I'm not sure if you were the director, but producer behind, uh, uh, behind the um, uh, award-winning film, uh, Rosewater. Next, we have Harlow Holmes. Harlow, 
Uh, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Harlow is Director of Digital Security at the Freedom of the Press Foundation. And uh, you are on the front lines of internet freedom and protecting journalists. So we're really happy to, um, to have you here and, and hope to hear more about that side of the problem. Uh, and then um, Mallory Nodal. Mallory, um, we have another chief technology officer with us today. Um, she is the CTO for the Center for Democracy and Technology. She's done uh, quite a bit of work with the um, Internet Research Task Force on Human Rights. Um, and um, fortunately, there is no um, a, a CTD event today, which is why we picked February 11th, Mallory, uh, because your events are so numerous and so popular that we can't possibly compete with it. But um, keep up the good work there. And then finally, um, I'd like to welcome Sarah Macon. Sarah, in her most uh, recent two jobs, was the former uh, deputy assistant to the president. And she had a, a, a very demanding and uh, responsible position as senior director for strategic engagement at the National Security Council. Um, I know Sarah's done a lot of work in international religious freedom, and we'd like hear, to hear a lot more about the uh, strategy and priorities and policies. Well, looking at that $70 million top line, um, one would have the impression that all is well and good in the world of internet freedom, that um, we have plenty of money. I might ask some of the panelists uh, at some point, or Aram, you can ch chime in as well. Aram Sinraik is going to be our discussion leader uh, for today and my close colleague at uh, American University. Um, but if you had $70 million to spend, Aram, I might ask you where you might spend it at some point in today's discussion. But to start us off, I'd like to hear from Dr. Chang, um, because he's probably had the uh, greatest span of control over uh, internet freedom programs in his role as the um, uh, Secretary of State Science Advisor, and we'd like to get your views on kind of where things stand, where we have been, and where we are headed. So, Dr. Chang, please. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, mic check, see if uh, you can hear me. Great, thank you so much. It's a great a pleasure and honor to be part of this panel. I want to thank American University, a voice of uh, internet freedom and internet society for organizing uh, part two of this uh, very important conversation. And uh, Erica, <clears throat> I think you might have uh, overestimated uh, my influential power and ability over anything budget related. Uh, but uh, I would certainly love to uh, start a bit of a conversation around the guardrails and the pillars of uh, digital freedom. And certainly in my mind that a fundamental premise for tech diplomacy for the United States is that technology must advance freedom. And in this century and beyond, digital freedom is the primary manifestation, the primary form in which freedom resides. And I want to first spend uh, a couple of minutes to describe what I think as the four guardrails, principles of digital freedom, what I call the transparency, minimalism, optionality, and recourse. That uh, whether we're talking about an AI system uh, or communication system, such as the internet, the first and foremost is transparency of the policies by the companies involved by the government to the end users. And second is that it should be a minimalistic approach, just like if somebody at the restaurants want to know whether uh, alcohol can be served to you, uh, all that we need to know is a binary answer, are you above age 21 or not? Uh, certainly, at least in this country, uh, that is the binary question. I don't need to know your birthday. I don't need to know your social security number to answer that question. 
Thirdly is optionality, that in addition to being transparent and minimalist, you should also be given as an end user a chance to opt out and never be assumed to be automatically opt in. And finally, recourse. I think this is the sharpest contrast between the nightmarish Orwellian vision of 1984 and what we would like to see from technology. And that is when an end user feels that her rights to transparency, minimalism, and optionality are under threat or damaged, then she has a recourse through an independent judiciary and a fair judicial system with rule of law to appeal and litigate against the companies and the government. Now, internet freedom, I think, is part of digital freedom. And there are generally three attacks that's happening to internet freedom. One is censorship and blockage. Two is propaganda. And three is surveillance. So the first two work hand in hand with each other. One is to take away your ability to get what you want. And the other is to force feed you uh, what they would like to, to read and see. And then the third one is just surveilling you, uh, usually without any of digital uh, freedom principles. So uh, let me maybe spend the last two minutes of my opening remarks to talk a bit about what we can do for each of those three. I'll come back to the censorship in just a minute, but I think on the propaganda front, the best way to defeat a bad arguments is to allow better arguments to have a platform to be voiced rather than to censor or silence and suppress any arguments. And then as to the surveillance, I think we uh, very much need research on anti-big data. We hear a lot of funding and progress <clears throat> in big data using machine learning. Perhaps it is time to do protection using anti-big data technology and research. As to the censorship part, which is the primary focus of this panel, uh, there are two dimensions. One is what we do with blockage. And there is a lot of exciting work going on using a combination of broadcast, whether it is shortwave radio or new satellite technologies, together with on the ground peer-to-peer -peer solutions. This broadcast plus peer-to-peer -peer, uh, is a very promising technology direction. As to the typical censorship without shutting down the entire internet with a kill switch. I think the two primary principles behind many technologies, one is hopping, the other is collateral cost. You would like to hop very fast along some dimensions and then try to hide behind a haystack so that in order to block the needle, some very useful haystacks must be blocked thereby increasing the collateral cost for the sensors. But at the end of the day, and I'll conclude my opening with this quick thought, and that is you need a social fabric of trust often to go alongside technological advances. And that's why we see some of the most popular and heavily used anti-censorship tools available today in actual S-scale deployment and usage are often built and deployed by those who have this human fabric trust built into their system. With that, I turn it back to Eric. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. I hope that uh, those four principles um, are uh, remembered and enshrined as the internet freedom, three laws of robotics at some point. So thanks again. Um, I'd like now to turn to uh, Harlow and ask her about the security side. Uh, we talk a lot about access and anti-censorship, but um, people also need to be protected um, uh, in the context of human rights and, and, and journalists. And in your work um, to um, advance um, digital security, um, where are we and where do we need to go? That's a very tall order to fill. Um, and also, thank you very much for having me on this panel uh, with a lot of very interesting guests that I rarely get the opportunity to be in conversation with. Um, 
much. Uh, by way of introduction, I will um, just yeah, kind of start out with it. Um, I'm the director of digital security at Freedom of the Press Foundation, which is a US-based nonprofit 501c3 um, whose mandate is to work with journalists um, in, primarily in the public interest in uh, telling the stories that they that the entire public desperately needs for them to tell. Um, we are based in the US, but we work internationally. And also from a personal perspective, um, I've had the immense privilege of working with a lot of the, uh, the, the technologies, the teams and institutions that you have worked with that you've mentioned and even go way further back than 2016, which was, you know, the, um, uh, that basis of that chart that you showed. Um, a lot of these projects and programs actually uh, got their funding, got their start in Washington and internationally uh, way before that. Um, so I do want everyone to appreciate that history, and I hope that we'll have that in more discussion um, during the course of this, of this talk. Um, but what Freedom of the Press Foundation does is, I would like to say threefold. We do three things, and I think we do them very well. Um, one is uh, my department, which is the Digital Security Training Department. Um, we perform a lot of trainings, consultancies, and we also have a, um, a digital security auditing practice, uh, a program that we've built from the ground up. And we work primarily with, um, uh, with journalists and documentarians from enterprise level down to um, freelancers. Uh, we work with a lot of umbrella institutions and form alliances with them, such as like the uh, International Women's Media Foundation, uh, the Sundance uh, Documentary Institute. Uh, so it spans the gamut and we love doing this work. Um, uh, another thing that we do is um, uh, technology building. So we have a team of engineers that um, have spearheaded among a, a number of things, but like our flagship product is something called SecureDrop. Uh, SecureDrop is a newsroom appliance that connects uh, journalists within newsrooms to the public at large um, when they are willing and able to become whistleblowers uh, to connect them via the Tor network um, and a number of other technologies that we have like bundled into it uh, in order to ensure from a, at least a technological perspective that they can actually have that confidential communication. And um, we are very proud to have not only created a really, really like um, uh, uh, effective platform for newsrooms to use, uh, I'm not going to, we, we don't have any insight into how newsrooms use SecureDrop uh, by design. Um, uh, and it's only when people tell us that, you know, we were impactful in getting these stories published, but we have a running tab of numerous stories that have actually changed the course of, you know, like contemporary history just due to the fact that we were able to connect people. Um, we also have an advocacy team uh, that is very active, including our own little newsroom called the US Press Freedom Tracker uh, that documents incidents where members of the press have had their rights trampled upon. And uh, uh, this project started in 2017, maybe 18, sorry, don't quote me on that. But um, when it started, um, we uh, were looking at like a different relationship with uh, between uh, members of the press and, you know, like uh, the law enforcement, um, the public at large, you know, whatever uh, that journalists ultimately face. But these infractions on press freedom within the United States have ramped up um, considerably over the past maybe two years. Um, I, I'm not going to go into details here, but if you do want to look at the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, um, you would be amazed uh, to see exactly how much uh, um, members of the press have been challenged in doing their job. And I'm sure from all of our perspectives at our various posts, we've seen that similarly. Um, but one thing that I do want to spotlight and that go like that, um, creates a thread between all of these different sources um, is our reliance on open source. So uh, that goes from like a, a various, you know, like different perspectives. Like one, of course, SecureDrop is open source and actually adds its open source that allows us to 
perform the role that we do as, you know, like people who will help you get secure drop up and running. People will help train your staff on how to use it. People who will even help, you know, like um, uh, discuss with you how to approach investigations when you need it, because we actually have no insight into what your secure drop contains and we're okay with that. And actually fun anecdote, whenever somebody calls me up and they say like, oh, like Harlow, um, I, I really want to work on this story. And like, I'm like, stop. I don't actually care. I want to read about it when it comes out. Just tell me about your tech problems. Um, but uh, also we've done stuff like open sourcing the rest of it. Uh, we have a project called Secure the News, uh, which is a fork of another project that came out of 18F, um, which is a great organization uh, in DC, um, uh, centered in the US government for building technology projects um, that uh, actually rates newsrooms on how open they are um, as far as like the, uh, you know, the encryption that they provide and the protection to their visitors, their newsroom visitors, the everyday public is concerned. Um, we also recently open sourced uh, the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker. So uh, any jurisdiction, not just in the United States, but other countries uh, can take that same methodology um, and build their own site in order to continue to report on what they're seeing locally. Um, and in addition to like open sourcing the code, which is incredibly important, we also open source the data because that's where credibility comes from. Um, so uh, the What's really cool, I have to actually um, uh, give uh, 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 commendations to our web development team, uh, is that uh, the US Press Freedom Tracker was designed from the very beginning with an API at its core. So if ever any person who is researching this period of history that we're currently living in, um, they can actually use that API not only to um, absorb the data as narrative, but to absorb the data as quantitative data. Um, and so these are fundamentals that are incredibly important to me. Um, finally, uh, I will say uh, that, uh, you know, like we have, um, once again, as not only a member of, uh, of Freedom of the Press Foundation, but as a member of this broader community, um, I have had the immense privilege, uh, privilege to work with so many other organizations. And we've also um, learned a lot of lessons uh, coming to a criteria of um, evaluating what we do uh, or the projects that come out of our community and how we should promote them. And from a trainer's perspective, that's incredibly important because um, as a trainer, when I am going into, you know, like a, a certain situation, when I have to make recommendations about what a particular investigative unit should use, um, how you should communicate with this source, how you should get this data across several borders, et cetera. Um, all of these recommendations that I make are not based on the tools themselves, but they're based off of certain criteria. And that is openness, honesty, um, and ultimately, like, uh, it's a fundamental commitment to advancing a free press. I mean, in addition to, you know, the, 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 the technology behind it, it's um, cryptographic ability to, you know, ensure confidentiality. There's so many other factors. Um, and so this is why I'm very proud to be, um, you know, like a, a member of this broader community with its commitment to a holistic and overreaching commitment to all of these separate factors that a lot of people when they're just tool building never actually think about. Um, so um, really uh, like love to be in dialogue uh, and even from you know, the, the previous uh, introduction, there's a lot to, to kind of absorb and I would love to talk to you about. And that's it, thank you for having me. Very good, thank you Harlow. Um, we also welcome your contributions to this community because uh, they're, they're truly outstanding. Um, I'd like to turn now to Maziar, and um, uh, today is the 42nd anniversary of the uh, Islamic Revolution. Um, uh, Maziar wrote a great piece in Iran Wire um, about that event. Maybe he can tell us a little bit about what's happening in the country right now. But uh, as a content uh, producer, um, it would be interesting to know about the um, availability of how we deliver independent news uh, and information and the challenges of creating it digitally and then allowing your um, listeners, viewers, and audience to uh, obtain that information and um, act on it. Mazur? 
Well, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, is my microphone on? I can't see myself. Is my microphone on? We can see and hear you, Mazar. You can see and hear me. Okay, thank you so much. I couldn't see. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this event. Uh, and thanks everyone for participating. So yesterday was the anniversary of the uh, Islamic Revolution. And to me, uh, this is very symbolic because what internet freedom means to me is controlling the narrative. And the way that Ayatollah Khomeini managed to lead the Islamic revolution 42 years ago was uh, through controlling the narrative. He managed to control the narrative, take the narrative away from the Shah, mobilize the mosques, mobilize the masses through audio cassettes. I'm not sure how many of the members of the audience remember the audio cassettes, the little things that we used to record things. And, you know, uh, so those were the, those were his, uh, that, that was his medium. He used to record his messages to his followers in his house in uh, Iraq, in exile, and send the cassettes into Iran. And sometimes his messages were written by his uh, followers and they were Xeroxed and photocopied and they were spread around the uh, country. 42 years later, we are still fighting for controlling the narrative by the Islamic government in Iran, as well as the people of Iran, as well as the opposition. So uh, as Eric mentioned, I'm the president of Journalism for Change. And one of the main projects that we have is Iran Wire, which is a website that it's in iranwire.com, which is a website which is in uh, Persian, English, Azerbaijani, and several other languages. And we are the beneficiaries of uh, internet freedom. What we are trying to do, we are trying to find the little gaps here and there when they are available uh, inside Iran in order to somehow affect the narrative in Iran and not creating our own narrative, but by allowing Iranian audiences to share their information, gather information, disseminate information, and sometimes, in some cases, be able to coordinate their efforts in order to make the government more accountable. So what we have witnessed in the past uh, decade or so since, let's say, 2009, when the Green uh, Movement happened, was the Iranian government has been the Iranian government trying to control the narrative not only through propaganda and uh, through terrestrial television and satellite television, but also by narrowing the band internet bandwidth, expanding it at some times, uh, using filter busters, and uh, it's inter it might be interesting for some of the panelists to know that the Iranian government is using Chinese technology in order to censor the internet. And on the other hand, the Iranian, uh, Iranian people, they are using uh, Chinese uh, filter busters like Freegate in order to crack through the uh, censorship and uh, access the information. So, uh, Iranians have been, uh, in 2009, during the uh, Green Movement, the Iranian, uh, many millions of Iranians, they used the available uh, av internet platforms, especially at that time, uh, Twitter and Facebook, which were new phenomena at that time, in order to share information, gather information, and mobilize themselves and came to the streets. And the government has realized that. So they have been trying in different ways in order to uh, affect this uh, 
mobilization by people. They have had agents that uh, infiltrate different uh, sites. They gather information on opposition members. We heard the news from an Israeli company the other day that the Iranian government gathers information on people through different apps. And sometimes they just uh, do it the old fashioned way, like uh, they did it in November 2009 during the demonstrations, and they just shut down the internet in order to uh, uh, just stop the demonstrations and stop the people being able to mobilize themselves. So uh, for me, when we are talking about internet freedom and how can uh, different governments, how can different organizations help people, the best way to do it and, the, and the, I think the most effective way to be able to have any kind of change in Iran is to create uh, technology like or expand technologies like Starlink, Elon Musk's satellite internet technology, help different uh, VPNs like Siphone and others. And that way, I think the, there will be a very uh, peaceful uh, change in Iran because people will be able to uh, have access to the information, be able to talk to themselves, be able to discuss ideas, and be able to uh, share the information of what is going on inside the country with us and through us with the rest of the world or directly through social media with the rest of the world. Because at the moment, uh, what has happened in the absence of free flow of information in Iran uh, many people outside of the country, including some Iranians, they have a very uh, distorted image of what is going on in Iran. They are, uh, their decisions, sometimes they are affected by the echo chambers that exist outside of the country. And I think uh, if uh, the United States government uh, wants to have a long-term change uh, in Iran for the better, the best way, and I think the most uh, efficient way, the cheapest way to do that is through uh, investing in satellite internet technology and VPNs in order to allow people to talk to themselves, gather information and disseminate information with themselves and with the rest of the world. Okay, thank you very much, Maziar. Um, yes, there are some new technologies on the horizon and uh, maybe that will um, expand the uh, horizons of internet freedom, we certainly hope so. Um, I'd like to turn to Mallory and then to Sarah uh, for our next set of, of remarks. Uh, Mallory, the United States uh, should not do this alone. Um, where do we stand, um, you know, given your experience with the Freedom Online Coalition and, and your other work, um, how do we enlist the support uh, of like-minded countries and where should the Biden administration be uh, putting its emphasis on, on that score? Thanks, and thanks very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to talk about CDT's work and also um, my other affiliations that have put me into internet governance spaces, which tend to be, um, have a really global and international focus. So it, CDT, um, we really do two things. Um, for those who aren't familiar, um, we really um, are good at tech informed policy. So we've recently put out um, some priorities for the Biden administration around um, democracy and technology, which I can tweet out um, after this session. Um, and then the other thing that I lead on is a vertical around um, technology and human rights. So really trying to get into um, the technical community and engineering focused spaces to have conversations about what's best in the public interest. How do we solve problems such as privacy while balancing other potentially conflicting issues? Um, how do we solve censorship from a technical perspective? Um, so the policy and tech are really joined together. And you're right that we, the US can't solve it alone. And on the other hand, it's something that was on the first slide that you shared, which is that internet freedom is a cornerstone of the US's foreign policy. It's now the way that 
um, the U.S. has been influential and led um, on democratic values internationally by working with other democratic governments, such as those that are members of the Freedom Online Coalition, um, and built you know, coalitions and funding pools around this. So one of the things that has come up before is um, you know, issues around funding. And I think the U.S. does um, offer the most funding for internet freedom projects, for alternative free and open source tools, um, for activists, whistleblowers, and journalists to use, but we need more. And I think, um, you know, CDT and several other NGOs recognized the need for that um, in the past year by signing a letter asking other democratic governments to step up. We know that Sweden also funds um, quite a bit, um, but we'd like to see more, especially the Freedom Online Coalition governments, um, helping fill that gap because we need uh, a variety of sources to keep. Um, a lot of these existing and useful tools active and well-maintained um, in addition to the massive amount of resources that have to be spent in the multitude and proliferating internet governance mechanisms um, that are required to truly run an open internet um, with as many multi with as many stakeholder input as possible um, and then the last thing that was also mentioned by someone else was we need a lot more research to be honest um, to know exactly um, what are some of these gaps and trade-offs um, that that we so carefully walk and I would just say um, out of the admin out of the priorities that CDT laid out for the Biden administration there are a few that I just wanted to highlight that I think the U.S. can do domestically while also working internationally, um, but leading by example in some cases, and, and also um, the opposite, which is you know taking um, taking the lead from others who've done well. I mean, the first one is privacy legislation. I mean, that's just clear. We really need that in the United States, and we can take a page um, from some of our democratic partners um, abroad. Um, it is really about minimalism in this case. We just need to limit limit collection, limit sharing, limit use. Of, of user data. And I would say that the US has an opportunity to craft um, privacy legislation that centers issues such as anti-discrimination. Um, and we can, again, and, and, and try to correct racial justice and that could really improve and iterate upon other privacy legislations that we see um, in many other countries and make it very, very strong. Um, another one is around things that are already being, that have already been done um, by, by US administrations in the past, but um, need to continue, and that is to create guidance around procurement uh, for federal, state, municipal governments um, of technology. Um, they need, it needs to set a really high bar for especially dual use technologies because of the risk of, um, you know, use of, for surveillance and, and other things. Um, and then on that point around dual use technologies, guidance around export controls and things like that are really welcome um, in making sure that that is, those are developed with as many stakeholders as possible to make sure that they're not overly aggressive. Um, next, I wanna talk about um, a, a dual use technology that a lot of people like to talk about, which is encryption, end-to-end -end encryption in particular, um, which needs to be protected, needs to continue to be protected by the Biden ad administration because we know that not just in the US, but abroad in other countries, Brazil, India, the UK, Australia, um, there are, there are, you know, there are agencies um, that would really like to disrupt the ways, the technical ways in which end-to-end -end encryption works, and we just need that um, to, to be off the table. Because we've not only seen the backdoor conversation come up over and over again for a couple of decades, it's actually escalating. I think what law enforcement agencies are asking for now go well beyond what we consider to be a backdoor in the 90s, and I think we need to be really clear about that. Um, Net neutrality would be really great to have once again. I think we have the benefit of trying again to, to bring back net neutrality, but also understanding the technical ways that um, ISPs are um, trying to improve efficiency. Um, so we need to, I think there's a lot of research that can be done here, but looking at emerging technologies such as you know edge computing and network slicing and that sort of thing to um, really define what we think net neutrality is and how ISPs can abide by it best while still, you know, delivering good services and filling the digital divide. So unpacking that tension 
um, with some solid policy would be super excellent. Um, and just lastly, um, I'll just mention funding again, because I think restoring funding, increasing funding, um, leveraging relationships abroad to also um, find new sources of funding is incredibly important because internet governance, like I mentioned before, is a, um, an ever increasing space. It isn't just that the internet and its governance is being talked about at you know um, one UN body. It is now being talked at, at all of them, the Human Rights Council, the WTO, all of these agencies now have some stake in how the internet is governed. And that puts a huge strain on advocates like myself and other civil society members who we know are important to these conversations because it means we have to be everywhere and that's really difficult to do. Um, so we need to think about funding for that um, and, and what we've set out to achieve, which is um, truly well-informed um, policy setting. Um, and I think really that's it. I would just say that um, I'm looking forward to um, the US taking a lot more leadership again in bodies like the Freedom Online Coalition, um, because there's just, I think the internet, since it was founded, the FOC that is, it's also been 10 years and a lot has changed. Um, and there's a lot more work than there used to be. Very good, thank you so much, Mallory. Um, in addition to uh, looking at um, what we can do with a lot more money. Um, we also have to have a network of implementers who can make things happen. And um, one of the people who has had a tremendous amount of experience with that is uh, Clara. And so Clara, um, if you had that $70 million, kind of what are the opportunities and what are the obstacles toward getting things done uh, to advance uh, the cause of internet freedom. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, first off, for having me on this very esteemed panel. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about my background and then uh, jump into um, exactly this topic of what can we do to be more efficient with funding? Because this is often a black box that makes it really hard for some of the most marginalized groups and voices to be able to effectively deploy solutions on the ground. Um, so I had joined US government uh, back in 2016, actually under the Obama administration in a program called the White House Presidential Innovation Fellows, which brings entrepreneurs from the private sector into a term of residence inside US government uh, to really think about pushing the envelope when it comes to innovation. Harlow had described the group called 18F that she had worked with on building some tools. Um, 18F was actually created out of the first cohort of Presidential Innovation Fellows who really said we need a top of the line digital agency within US government that can really build 21st century solutions that are open source, transparent, and inaccessible for all agencies uh, to, to really effectively uh, build out digital tools. Um, as my, during my time as a PIF and, and shortly after I was asked to serve as uh, the chief technology officer of, of two teams, both administratively based at the Department of Homeland Security uh, focused on homegrown extremism, election security, and online disinformation. And there were a number of grants that we had given out um, to different implementers at the local level. We also worked with a number of other government agencies. Um, and so I kind of wanted to start off this conversation by sharing just some five basic misconceptions about building, deploying, and working with US government and recommendations that we can take moving forward. So the first big misconception that most people have when it comes to grant making is that the funding will be fast. Um, and this is absolutely not true. Um, most groups that apply for funding, um, they are looking at staffing up on, uh, on different developers and staff to actually deploy different tools they've committed to. Uh, but oftentimes the procurement process is a lot more difficult than what most program teams anticipate. And so, uh, for example, in our instance, um, our grant program was delayed by almost a year. And we had nonprofits and local groups that were dependent on us for funding that unfortunately weren't able to get it at a much later point in time. Um, so this creates a really big challenge in that if there are front of the line groups that are working on very time pressing challenges, um, it becomes really hard for them to de depend on the US government for that main source of funding. This is also, the reason why it's very difficult for a lot of Silicon Valley startups to actually build more solutions in this space. Um, they are so new, um, they cannot depend on the longer term procurement timeline for when funding will land. 
Um, so uh, one of the big recommendations moving forward is really allowing for faster deployment of contracts that can be given out in quicker spurts, um, in quicker intervals to, to different teams uh, that are building solutions and tools. Uh, the second big mis misconception uh, is that government agencies actually coordinate with each other when it comes to uh, deploying and funding tools. Um, and the second part is, of course, around internet freedom that governments, you know, obviously, especially in the US, um, agencies should, should obviously have the right contacts at social media companies. Um, this is absolutely not true. Uh, there are still to this day, many silos, um, in my experience, working with agencies around tools that were very similar that we were all trying to build. Um, and a set of tools that are often funded, um, a lot of a lot of beltway bandits, a lot of contractors that are very familiar in um, working with agencies, they'll end up just uh, relabeling and retooling uh, existing solutions they've built for other agencies um, and, and trying to resell it in um, to, to really monetize. And this often leads you know, a lot of uh, more, uh, more marginalized groups and, and, um, and those that are really working frontline um, to really miss out on being able to participate. Um, government agencies um, that I've worked with from the Global Engagement Center to State Department, um, they, it, it's also very hard to discuss what's working and what's not. So if one agency has spent, for example, one year uh, trying to deploy a tool that was very hard to do, um, it is very hard for those best practices to, sh to be shared because nobody wants to discuss uh, failure. <laughs> and uh, when something fails, um, it might impact the ability for that particular program team to be able to get funding for that next year. So it's incredibly hard uh, for this coordination to be taken place in a transparent way. Um, but uh, it is something that is so important for, uh, you know, for funding moving forward for us to have this dialogue because at the end of the day, it is American taxpayer dollars that are suffering when um, we experiment in a way that is non-efficient. And when the same government agencies are funding the same exact tools and, and not coordinating necessarily with each other. So one of the, the great things um, uh, over the last few years is there's been increased coordination uh, of, of actually accessing uh, tools that have a blanket contract among many different agencies so that nobody has to go through and procure the same tools um, again and again. Um, so that has been a positive shift. Um, the third point I wanted to make is that not only um, is it hard to coordinate, but um, it's, it's uh, easy to deploy the latest visual tools <laughs> across um, government uh, teams. Um, this is absolutely not the case. Um, a lot of the other panelists earlier have talked about the use of uh, emerging technologies from blockchain to, to Tor and um, other kinds of decentralized applications. Um, unfortunately, today, there's a lot of challenges with um, government agencies feeling comfortable still with, with what was funded and how it's funded and how um, user information is collected. Um, a lot of um, privacy officers today are not necessarily as familiar with product development. And so it becomes really hard for uh, a lot of teams to be able to move forward with the authority to operate, uh, even when that tool is built. And this is something that was especially challenging for me when we were trying to deploy a number of tools that we had spent a lot of time working with developers to build over the course of a year. Uh, there was a lot of concern that, that came from our privacy team, uh, at different agencies that that mentioned, um, you know, not quite not quite understanding how user data is collected. Um, at the end of the day, this leads to solutions where a lot of the main key features that are meant to actually allow for, um, uh, you know, progression of freedom, uh, internet freedom uh, issues, um, those key features are often turned off, and it becomes very hard for implementation partners to actually use the solutions. Um, the fourth misconception is that funded tools are tested and evaluated. You know, most, most people expect a very uh, strong uh, and rigorous uh, evaluation program. Unfortunately, uh, this is, you know, quite hard to do. It's very easy for, for uh, many people to report success when uh, existing solutions are not there in the first place. Um, the other thing that's, that's very difficult uh, around testing and evaluation is actually the anticipated long-term cost of maintenance. And Mallory had talked about this as well earlier, but 
Um, there are a lot of uh, hidden costs when it comes to maintaining existing software. And uh, this often leads a lot of tools that may have already been spent millions of dollars in funding um, not to be maintained um, after a year, uh, despite the existing R&D that goes into it. Um, and so um, it is really important as we move forward with, with grant making strategy to not only have short term, but a long term strategy around solutions uh, that are built, especially those that are custom solutions, where it needs um, a lot more maintenance uh, than, than what could you know, be anticipated before. Um, the last misconception is that typically in, in most grant processes, there is a diverse pipeline of grantees. Um, unfortunately, this is not the case. A lot of grants are put out very last minute um, in a black box where a lot of grant program officers are sharing it among an existing network of implementers they already know. Uh, this makes it really hard for those that are doing the most impactful work uh, to really keep up, especially those that are resource strapped already. Um, and so um, one of the things that um, is, is really important is for um, those in the Biden administration to really think about ways to really have a number of events to, to include an active uh, and diverse participation of those that know how to apply um, to ensure that you know, there is a process that uh, allows for um, more larger, larger and longer term contracting firms, um, the Beltway Bandits, <laughs> to be able to uh, have a backseat at the time so that uh, the more, um, underdeveloped voices um, who may not necessarily have the best in grant uh, in, in actually applying for uh, the grant application process, which might be rigorous and might be you know several months long, um, for those to be able to have an equal footing at the table. Um, the other big challenge uh, around creating a diverse uh, pipeline of grantees is actually uh, language and localization barriers. Um, this is especially challenging because language um, is often very hard to uh, tools for thinking about how to increase access uh, among you know, global regions, especially, are in incredibly hard um, to, to translate properly. Um, and so, uh, again, this is, this is something that um, is, is so important to think about is how do we ensure that there's not only diversity in, in the grantee pipeline, but also thinking about uh, localization in languages uh, all around the world. Um, so with that, um, wanted to turn it back to Eric. Great, thanks for, very much. Good advice. You know, um, you know I think you know, there's a, a lot of thinking that needs to be done between um, new technology and, and kind of risk taking to uh, stimulate innovation. You know, in addition to the major circumvention platforms that have a lot of running costs and complexity and you know, are delivering um, results you know, to tens of millions of people every day. So to round out our discussion, I'd like to turn the um, floor over to uh, Sarah Macon. Um, and I'd, I'd like um, to know a little bit more about uh, aggregating priorities and strategy. Where does that fit in the overall foreign policy and national security context? Um, what needs to be done to better focus uh, these issues um, uh, at a, a high level of policy and make sure that those equities are uh, represented. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It's it's really an honor to be part of a panel with such sincere, you can, can you hear me by the way? Did I unmute myself? Okay. Uh, with such sincere and truly eloquent voices who have such expertise, uh, including my friend Mung here. Um, I appreciate that you asked me to participate today. I, I'm just going to give really a brief uh, perspective given my time at the National Security Council. Um, you know, I, I do think it's important that we see internet freedom as a value, a human right, uh, as well as a commodity. Um, we don't need to look much further than what happened just this past week with the Clubhouse app in China and, and then the subsequent and almost immediate blocking of the app by the CCP. Uh, to see that there's little doubt that oppressed, persecuted, and exploited people around the world uh, rely on access to innovative digital platforms to break through the censorship that is imposed uh, on them so often by their own governments. And they need uh, those platforms uh, to connect with others. 
I, I think we all have a right to that genuine human connection. Um, and that is, that's what often helps, um, you know, whether it's China, Iran, Belarus, wherever it might be, uh, that, that's, that's what gives these, these oppressed people uh, the opportunity to share their stories. Um, I saw a, a powerful video very recently of, um, of a Holocaust survivor. She was talking about the phrase, never again. And she found the phrase somewhat you know, empty because uh, regimes around the world have continued to commit atrocities against vulnerable, vulnerable people really ever since those concentration camps closed. Um, specifically, she was referring to uh, what's taking place today in Xinjiang. Um, and we know that the CCP is exploiting uh, technological means uh, among many other means to violate the basic human rights of Uyghurs, um, including facial recognition uh, software and technology and tracking software. We know that authoritarian and totalitarian regimes will always find ways to violate human rights um, of vulnerable people. Tech is just one tool they use to do it. Um, so, so looking at a, at a broader strategy for the USG, um, part of any US government strategy for addressing human rights violations in the tech space should consider how we counter malign actors and keeping in mind that we should always maintain the moral high ground uh, of accountability and freedom for all people everywhere. Um, and then I think viewing internet freedom as a commodity would allow USG officials as well as private center, uh, sector entities and advocates uh, like many here on this panel to, you know, on behalf of internet freedom, to include this as part of negotiations with foreign governments and encourage them to release their control in many ways uh, and, and try to explain the benefits of doing so. I would hope that that would in, in the future lead to more progress. So I think seeing it as both a human right and a, and a value as well as a commodity is important um, in building that into the way that the USG uh, sees it and, and, and handles, handles it as an issue. Um, I think in general, we would benefit from a larger strategy though than, than what we have employed in the past. Um, and that was something that we began working on in 2020 uh, when I served at the National Security Council. Um, I, I, listening to, to Clara, um, I, I, yeah, I almost don't, I don't wanna repeat so much. She said, she went through so eloquently. And so I really just wanna associate myself with, with all of her comments earlier about the dynamics around both the grant making process um, the challenges associated with increased coordination um, of the interagency um, and the barriers that she identified. I, I mean, she, she listed them. I couldn't have done that any better if I had um, tried, uh, including the Beltway Bandits issue, right? So um, those were all things that we saw um, and all things that came up as we tried to go through and, and, and make a strategy that really worked and, and um, would work quickly. Um, nothing worked quickly. It is the U.S. government, um, but I, I, I'd still, you know, recommend just some general suggestions on mechanisms uh, to kind of get the progress um, and the process moving. Um, I mean, the USG needs to to we need to find a way uh, to work with tech platforms that can provide rapid order of magnitude increases. And um, you know, I think to Clara's point, if if um, if there is a challenge in how we um, how how we um, monitor that or count that, then we need to find a way to do it um, because we need to be funding circumvention tools that that work and implement um, intentional uh, implement an intentional funding model that responds to real time re responds in real time to the demonstrated successes of the tech um, and can address some of the concerns that she also eloquently laid out. Um, because you know we have to we have to be responsive to the to the American taxpayer, um, and I think there's a way to deploy a centralized USG strategy that doesn't impede or sacrifice progress in innovation. Um, there's no reason for the USG to guide R and D, which shouldn't be involved in that space. Uh, it should instead just provide resources for scaling up in areas where uh, the success has been demonstrated. Um, that's my opinion, but um, if we can find a way to demonstrate that success, I think that's where the USG can play a, its best role. Um, and so um, I, I would just close with um, words, uh, what I think are wise words of someone I once worked for. Uh, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And um, I am grateful uh, for the folks on this panel who provide that vigilance in this policy area. Um, count on you guys to keep it up.
So thank you for having me today. I appreciate it very much. Hey, thank you, Sarah. That was um, a great summary. Um, in our remaining time, I'd like to uh, turn the uh, program over to my colleague, uh, Aram Sinrak, who will lead the Q&A. Um, Aram, we have uh, a few questions that have been stacked up in the uh, Q&A from our, um, our audience, which is fine, but uh, it's up to you as to how you want to proceed. So take it away, my friend. Thank you, Eric. I, I think I want to start with an issue, a word that came up a lot in your, in your introductory remarks was the word trust, right? And ultimately, technology only works as part of a larger social system, a political system, a cultural system, an institutional system. And all of those systems run on the presumption of trust between the individuals and the institutions who are participating in them. Um, now, a lot has changed since the heady days a decade ago when internet freedom became a, a, a central element of American foreign policy. Uh, we've seen uh, the, um, the Snowden revelations. We've seen uh, the Trump administration basically dismantling a lot of what the Obama administration had done. Uh, we've seen the so-called tech clash where um, Consumers in the U.S. and around the world have become increasingly skeptical of the motivations of both big tech and tech startups in getting into this space. So I guess my opening salvo for you guys is how does the trust, the growing empirically observable trust gap uh, impact abilities to deploy and build uh, investment and adoption of Internet freedom platforms? Maybe Harlow, since you're uh, on the ground working with sure. journalists, so you can start off with this one. Um, sure, sure. Um, so, uh, well, first off, um, from like a personal perspective, um, in the trainings and the consultings that I have done and continue to do, I would say that um, it's imperative to be for, like upfront about the limitations of any of these projects, no matter where they come from, no matter how they're funded. Um, uh, also, uh, I will say that historically, uh, people in like, you know, the internet freedom and circumvention technology space have been historically very um, skeptical about uh, uh, technologies that are closed source, um, technologies that are enterprise level, but we're starting to uh, come to a little bit of a medium ground where we, uh, we figure like uh, we can do a lot more good uh, by teaching people how to use these things appropriately and as safely as possible, rather than, um, you know, just the shunting the, everybody off with like the, the Axiom use signal use tour, although use signal use tour. Um, another thing that I would say as far as like trust is concerned um, has to do with like the, uh, the process that we've built around the tool building. Um, it's not just um, uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, like you have a GitHub repository where people can like audit the code, but, um, you also have open discussions about things like re reproductible builds. So, you know, exactly like, um, how these services are managed, the relationship between these services and inevitably the, um, big consumer players that you're going to have to contend with, such as hosting on Amazon, how you, um, you know, treat your buckets on AWS, um, as far as like user data is concerned, how you are planning on, um, the inevitable day when you have to answer requests from law enforcement. Um, not only that, um, actually Clara mentioned uh, things like internationalization uh, and other like community tools. Um, over the, the, the very short course of the, this um, community building, the internet freedom space has invested heavily, not only in the tool building, but also these like, uh, I guess you would say auxiliary tools like localization lab, um, like um, Simply Secure um, and other projects that actually uh, make sure that things are properly inter internationalized so people can read them in their languages, um, have UX properties that are accessible to 
people from a varying scale. So it doesn't end up to be just another like crypto nerd project that nobody's going to use that wastes taxpayers money. Um, so like that effort is actually there. And seeing that happen in the open and also inviting communities internationally to participate in that goes a very, very long way. And actually I could even go into the weeds to talk about like, you know, the, the, um, the ways that we've had to work and look inward um, to root out toxicity within the community, to make it more accessible, to hold space for people to have conversations and to feel safe asking questions, all of those things. Yeah, sometimes some of those projects are funded by taxpayer money, but we would not have been where, or we would not have gotten to where we are right now without those things. Um, and no one should forget the importance of those, of those things. So, um... That's a great starting point. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the people who are not technologists, the people who are on the ground in, in Myanmar uh, or, you know, uh, in the People's Republic of China or in Iran who are trying to just develop communities and uh, political movements in relative safety uh, and privacy. Um, how, how is it possible to communicate trust to those communities when the US government at the same time as it's investing in these platforms is also promoting, you know, as Mallory mentioned, like anti-encryption legislation like the Earn It Act um, is also engaging in, uh, in, in hacks, you know, uh, from Stuxnet on. Uh, right now, the, the, the fact that the entire US government has essentially been hacked through SolarWind and all the associated stuff that we're still learning about, um, how does how do we how do we how is it possible to communicate the degree of trust necessary to get those most vulnerable communities to invest in the most useful tools um, in in the midst of this uh, this kind of fog of mistrust that that has come to pervade uh, the use of technology? Um, Aram, uh, if I may uh, take the crack at that important question, I think. Uh, a particular two free gate was mentioned early on, and it is immensely popular and very highly used. And I think it helps to look at the success cases of those tools that have proven to have a high adoption rate in certain key uh, demographics and regions. And I'll encourage everybody to take a look at uh, the video from part one of this conversation, where multiple providers of these tools talked about their experience. And I think if you look at Freegate and the like, uh, they distribute and encourage usage in part based on uh, the social fabric of trust. Uh, that's one reason why they have a very high adoption rate. And by the way, uh, with uh, a lot of the benefits to different various definitions of open source, one could also argue whether a tool like Freegate, is that open source according to all definitions? Probably not, uh, but uh, that's all right. Uh, it turns out they are perhaps the most heavily used. Now, I guess uh, adoption is ultimately the only key fundamental metric, and they're very high on that metric. Uh, we can all learn a lot from how these proven adoption successes have worked. And I know that there was a chart shown earlier, six different areas, categories of funding, one of which is service. And uh, while it's not as uh, glamorous as fundamental research, perhaps, it actually points to the direction of capacity building. And often, uh, the limitation is on the uh, capacity that can be provided uh, to the successful tools already working out there. Uh, and there are still a lot of wonderful research. You know, by the way, I would encourage also folks to take a look at research done by um, teams at, say, Chicago, uh, Nick Feimster at Princeton, my former colleagues, uh, Jennifer Rexford uh, and Patik Mittal. Uh, outstanding fundamental research. Uh, and I think is not mutually exclusive to also look at trust-based adoption of uh, many of those research in a variety uh, of forms and shapes. Over. Um, I'm not 
uh, the the moderator um, and also I definitely do appreciate uh, that uh, researchers publish um, their white papers and you know like stake their claims I mean that is absolutely fundamental but there is a little bit of a tautology um, involved um, in uh, saying that it's trusted because it's so widely used would you mind elaborating uh, it's a it's a tautology. Um, it's trusted because it's widely used doesn't necessarily mean that something is trustworthy. So right. let me uh, maybe I can uh, try to help address that uh, from my biased angle here. Uh, one is that because of the trust in the social fabric that uh, the founders and operators of these tools have on the ground understanding of what's going on in a particular country, let's say. And therefore, the way that these tools are distributed and used rely upon that social trust. So trust is an enabler of wide adoption. Secondly, uh, the fact that it's so widely used and yet people are still using it, I think is also another continuous verification. Uh, it's like an audit, except it's audited by actual usage of people's ability to say, you know what? even though this is high on the list, still I dare to use it. And their ability, their daring to use it, I think is also one way to prove that there is uh, the trust needed for this to continue to work. So I wouldn't say it's tautological, I would say trust helps enable adoption and the continued success of adoption is a continuous verification of trust. Mallory, did you have uh, something you wanted to add? I just wanted to add that I think we are um, underestimating how much privacy protecting and, and, and uh, censorship resistant tools are in use because from a technological perspective, they're very much the same. I mean, if you can't see someone's activity over the network, it's really hard to block what they're doing or what they're looking at. Um, and then also there's the added benefit that it is generally really secure for end users. And that is the way that the industry, the larger tech industry has moved. So as we see end-to-end -end encryption, for example, um, in more and more messaging apps, we're getting signal on a mass scale because it's in WhatsApp, it's gonna, it's in Facebook Messenger, iMessage, Android messages, you know, and that that's because talking about, you know, um, supply and demand side, the business model has changed. Privacy is now the business model for a lot of tech companies. And we're seeing that that is shifting, maybe not, it's not yet widespread, but we see companies like Apple and Mozilla for sure. Um, some smaller sort of underlying, you know, service providers that we don't really see very much. I see them from a technical, in the technical community. And I think that that's a really important leverage point. Um, that you know, it's building trust with users and actually being sold a product that is trustworthy and that protects their privacy. And that's part of what people are choosing to use um, or why they're choosing to use it. And I think that that can sometimes be undermined actually by governments and has been undermined by the US in the past, really set internet freedom back over the last 10 years with the Snowden revelations and other things. And you know, to go back again and, and talk again about the you know, anti-encryption legislation, these are different parts of the government undermining one another. It is you know, an economic disaster to disrupt encryption. It is not helpful to, the, you know, to sow fear, um, uncertainty, and distrust about you know, different parts of the internet in elections, for example, and um, you know, dealing with objectionable content. There needs to be a little bit more coordination around that and the government in to make sure that we are fostering trust that's really critical and it's been mentioned multiple times and I agree that it's a really important element of this. Clara, did you have your hand up? I did. Uh, I wanted to just jump in and say, you know, big misconception because I had worked in both the Obama and Trump administration is that politicals play a large role. In fact, most grant programs um, are run by career uh, government employees that have been there for a really long time. And the trust that they build with organizations over time is, is so critical because you know, I was um, part of a grant program where um, we actually had grantees that were funded and committed funding during the Obama administration that because of symbolic representation uh, under Trump decided to reject funding that was given. And that just caused a lot of, you know, backwards, um, a lot of backwards movement in um, being able to have future grants <laughs> for these kinds of purposes. 
um, my team was really focused on countering um, white uh, homegrown extremism and obviously white supremacy in the US and uh, a lot of the symbolic movement of who is in power sometimes is counterintuitive to that. But just remembering that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, for also groups to remember that a lot of government programs are run by, by civil servants that are there to serve every single day who really, truly care about the problem at hand. They are the ones working the front lines, spending a lot of time with communities uh, really on the ground. And, um, you know, moving forward, that still needs to continue. Um, really having um, those people continue to have open dialogues of convening and talking and listening to the problem so that, uh, again, when we have more innovative um, tool makers and startups come into the table, they're not building in the dark either that are so, um, so far away from the actual on the ground user needs. Um, we've heard a lot earlier around uh, a number of um, a number of voices and groups uh, that may not necessarily be as resourced with the latest um, in technological innovation, how we can do better pairing to make sure that uh, those groups are talking with each other rather than staying in silos. And so I think all of that needs to continue. Um, there have been accelerators that have been set up inside US government um, that really try to pair, um, pair this innovation uh, together. Uh, so that, and, and, you know, during my time, I created a digital marketing academy to really help uh, more marginalized voices that were not as digitally literate, uh, be able to really figure out how to measure and evaluate uh, their programs in the online space. So, uh, you know, those really need to continue. It's also important that uh, to remember that not everyone is, is that digitally illiterate. Some of the most important voices are not online and how we can really make sure that um, we can carry those voices uh, online as well. Thank you. Those, those are great points. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to get to what I think is a really important question from one of our audience members who's based in Russia. And they're asking about the flip side of the coin, right? Um, the cost of having a truly open platform with very few controls over communication and content is that malicious actors can take advantage of those platforms to flood them with disinformation, with abusive and toxic speech, um, with bot nets and and the kinds of uh, messaging that can go through them that effectively turn into a kind of cultural denial of uh, service attack um, just overwhelming the public sphere with with so much disinformation that that real that truthful information can't cut through um, how do you guys envision a best practices balance between uh, an optimally open internet freedom platform and some kind of resilience against bad actors and disinformation. Um, Maziar, you've, you've been uh, silent so far. Maybe, uh, maybe you can lead off with that, with that one. Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question. And because the situation in Russia is very similar to Iran, I may be able to answer that. I think internet freedom uh, on its own, when we talk about internet freedom, is just one side of the coin. And it's like, if we talk about better highways and expressway, but if we don't have any traffic laws or we don't have good cars that can you know, travel in these good expressways or highways. I think uh, at the same time that we are talking about internet freedom, we have to think about the rules and regulations of uh, how internet uh, freedom can work how uh, freedom uh, can't work and also talk about the media media outlets that operate within this uh free atmosphere because if people do not have any reliable sources that they can go to in order to receive information there will be chaos and at the same time bad actors can uh, infiltrate and also technology companies, big technology companies, they are responsible for uh, monitoring the activities of what's going on in, the, in their sites. And, you know, I read this New York Times article about this Canadian woman who was going around and destroying the reputation of her former employers, which is horrible because as a human rights activist, I'm used to being criticized and I'm used to being in public and you know, people insult me on a regular basis and you know, I have death threats on a daily basis, but it doesn't really bother me. But when uh, ordinary people are subjected to such hatred and to such venom, that is the responsibility of technology companies that, uh, you know, that they have to uh, accept. 
So I think uh, while governments should definitely invest in um, internet freedom, they also have to think about global legislations for internet companies, for uh, multinational internet companies. And at the same time, they have to invest in local and um, local uh, meaning inside the United States, but at the same time, uh, media outlets, reliable media outlets outside of the US and you know, other countries as well, in order for people to be able to go to a reliable source to get the information. Otherwise there will be chaos and bad actors love nothing better than chaos. True, true, truer words were never spoken. Uh, anyone else have a, a final parting shot before I kick things back to Eric? Harlow, go ahead. Um, actually, I, I would be very curious um, to kick it off to Sarah, um, who had mentioned that uh, there is, you know, like the possibility of things being a human right and also a commodity. Um, and so uh, that would be my question. And I would love to, to discuss more about that. You know, I, I think I'm back off mute. Um, I, when, I, when I call it a commodity, I think my perspective there is just to make sure that it is included in, you know, what does negotiations from between us and other countries, right? And so you guys are clearly experts on this topic, right? I covered so many other things for many years, but when I saw this as something that was not always addressed or considered as a priority, I tried to see, I tried to figure out why that might be, right? And when it was put in a box as just a human right or as just something else, um, I saw that it would kind of fall to the wayside. And so one of the, the ways I started to look at it is, is you know, how do we get it, the attention that maybe it deserves? Um, and, and if it's considered a, as a commodity, um, maybe then, you know, USTR and, and others would, would then see it as an important and valuable um, asset or tool that they can use in, in negotiations. Um, and whether it be USG officials or uh, private sector entities or uh, advocates like yourselves, or for that matter, you know, business owners, being able to use it as they, as they discuss with either foreign governments or uh, counterparts in other countries and discuss why it's something um, that shouldn't be um, either taken for granted or taken advantage of or blocked, uh, you know, maybe an opportunity for us to make progress, um, but certainly open to, you know, uh, pushback on that, but that's that's how I saw it, is trying to at least open it up uh, so that it wasn't just put in a box somewhere, um, and then only DRL at state could fund it, or only, um, you know, these other smaller entities had an opportunity to find ways to um, make progress for some of these platforms or technologies. Um, we were always trying to come up with ways to uh, kind of expand the network, even within the USG, to address the issue. I don't know if that answers the question, Harlow, but I think I think it starts to, um, as always with these events, uh, I feel like we're just beginning to scratch the surface when we get to the end of our time. Uh, so um, I wish we had another hour to kick it around, but I've got to send things back to Eric to close out the show. Great, very good. Thanks, Aaron. Um, great job and great job, panelists. Please uh, join me in thanking them for uh, these excellent remarks. Um, I hope that we've been able to um, expose some of the um, uh, issues of the day um, that we've been able to look at um, priorities and policies and all of the components um, that our panelists have been able to um, uncover. Uh, but a lot of work remains to be done, as Aram says. You know, we've only just scratched the surface here. And I think it's up to the community and um, our 100 plus participants in this panel today to keep their eye on the Biden administration. And let's get transparency and all these other values that we hold so dear to come into play um, so that we have a, um, a vibrant um, dialogue, uh, that we have government accountability and that we are taking advantage in using the rather modest resources that we have to the uh, greatest value that we can that we can possibly uh, do. So with that, um, we are right on time. 
Uh, thanks again, uh, everyone. And um, I'm sorry that we were not able to answer all questions, but we have run out the clock. And um, it's been a very pleasurable afternoon for me and my colleagues at American University. Thanks to Matt, um, Chelsea, and Kate uh, Arian for putting this together. They did an absolutely super job at keeping us all online. And um, I wish you um, goodbye and good health. Thanks very much. Okay, bye-bye.